Hello, hello, hello. Welcome or welcome back to Fancy and Leather Podcast, aka the cozy podcast of your dreams. This week we are chatting to one of my oldest and dearest friends, Maisie. We chat about all things ranging from our experience of growing up together, what it was like for Maisie when she moved from Perth to Perth, meaning that she moved from one side of the world to another. And we really delve into education and lots of different factors all about it, discussing like the importance of education about colonialism and Aboriginality and all things like that. And it's a great episode. So so buckle up, grab your dressing gown and enjoy. Hello, welcome or welcome back. I know I already said that in the intro, but I felt the need to say it again. I'm so excited to be back talking to you guys. Episode two of the new rebrand. It's feeling good. It's feeling genuine. It's feeling real. I had so much fun recording this episode with Maisie. Very much in real time. We recorded it yesterday. And when you're listening to this, it's Sunday and this comes out on Monday. So we recorded it on Saturday. So very much in real time. I must confess that I'm probably not sounding 110%. And yesterday, I definitely was not feeling 110%. And um, it was my birthday. On Friday, I turned the big two six, um, and it was it was interesting. It was fun. Um, I'm someone that loves my birthday or like tries to love my birthday and make the best out of my birthday because being a January baby it is so hard for anyone else to make a big deal out of your birthday. That the only way you can actually enjoy it is by like being a control freak about it. And that is exactly what I do every year. I won't even lie. And I just think it's really important, especially in this day and age, to love yourself and celebrate yourself and be all for that. And um, I just think more people should do that. I don't know. I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of. Like, I'm alive. I'm still alive. That's great. That's incredible. And I'm celebrating that. And I'm celebrating the friendships I have and the family I have and the memories I have on this earth. And I don't know, I just, I think it's important. And honestly, like, I love an excuse to get all my friends in one room and socialize. So it may also be a factor, but I also just think, like, everyone is so sad in January. And it makes it so hard to, like, enjoy yourself. So I really have to bring it into my own hands to ensure that I have a good time. And I can report I most certainly did have a good time. Um, which is why on Saturday I was definitely feeling a little rough when Maisie and I recorded. But I think we both powered through and it was an incredible episode. Um, yeah, so a little birthday recap for my life update. In fact, maybe I'll do my small wonder first. Oh no. I'm yawning. This is two days after, but I'm still I'm still in struggle city. I don't think I can hack this life anymore. My small wonder is silent friendship time. I've just had some really great silent friendship time with different friends recently and it's been so nice and I always forget like how underrated silent friendship time is just being able to be in the same room and like do different things and be silent but still like appreciate each other's company I don't know I just love it um so birthday celebrations last weekend I went away for the weekend with two of my best friends and had the loveliest time. We went to um, just a little Airbnb near um, Loch Leven, and it was really fun. And um, just cozy, cozy vibes in the best way possible. And um, we arrived there the Friday after a lot of <laughs> redirection for me because I don't know. I just like trusted Google Maps too much, and turns out. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It turns out I clicked the wrong places a couple times, but it's fine. We got there. Whatever. We digress. It turns out even at 26, geography is not my strong point. And um, yeah, we got there the Friday night late, just hung out, played games. We played like a celebrity guess who I am game the Friday night, which was really fun. And then the Saturday, we literally didn't leave the Airbnb. It was raining all day, um, which honestly was kind of like a vibe it was very much incredible it was exactly what we wanted we wanted a cozy cozy weekend so we just kind of lived in dressing gowns or um udis or trackies or just like anything cozy um we ate in like we we bought a bunch of food on the friday to take with us 
and we set the fire, watched some like TV, played more games together. We played We're Not Really Strangers, which was really fun um, and like interesting to play a different game with my friends. And um, went in the hot tub, which was one of the like, reasons we booked the Airbnb, but we couldn't go in until the night because it rained and apparently you can't go in in the rain, which was kind of like crappy because otherwise it probably would have been in the hot tub most of the day. Um, and then the Sunday we went to the Deer Park, which is um, which is what it says in the tin. It's a it's a park where you can like feed deer and stuff. And there's some other animals. And um, I went there like growing up, and I hadn't been there in a very long time. I used to go there as a kid all the time, but I haven't been there in ages. So that was cute. Um, my friends fed some deer. I've had one deer with some of their food because I really just can't do like the animal saliva thing. It's just not for me. I'm sorry to people listening to this if you like are into that or like have a dog that does that. But like, I don't want any animal licking me ever. It just makes me so so uncomfortable. I even remember distinctively growing up, like my parents grabbing my hands and being like, "Keep it still," so that, like, the deer could come and eat off of it. And I was just so not for it. Now I was just throw the food <laughs> into the field. I did feed one deer. It was the nicest deer ever. It was just so cute and friendly and it was a perfect eater. It didn't really lick my hand at all. It just ate the food perfectly and it was did not like a money mouth or anything. So I was all for that, but that was all I needed to fill my, my heart. I just, I prefer to just look at them. I don't know. It's just who I am. And then we ate there, had a really yummy lunch there. I had a crepe before that and went on the flying fox, the best thing ever invented um I can report though I didn't like push any children out of the way there were some children around when I went on the flying fox however if there had been children around I would have just waited for them to leave and then gone on it because um you will never stop this girl from going on the flying fox I'm obsessed um that was like my favorite thing at the park growing up and my grand used to have one like opposite her house and I'd be on it for hours on end um and yeah, I had a really we had so I had a crepe and then I had a really nice lunch of soup and this incredible cheese and chive scone. Very wholesome vibes, very lovely time, and then came back obviously and worked. And then on my birthday on Friday, I had the cutest time ever. I was working in the morning, it was just half day Fridays at schools here, and it was so wholesome. The kids were adorable. I have a lovely little class just now. Um, they're all about like seven a seven or eight yeah most of them are seven and they were so cute one like little girl made me the most adorable bracelet with my initials on it and I am absolutely obsessed but like flowers from another kid chocolates Um, one of them brought in like a birthday banner from home to put on the window which obviously took back home with her afterwards it was just so cute we had a little dance party very wholesome vibes and then I went for lunch with two of the girls from work, which was so lovely. Just lovely little bistro. I had mussels and then panna cotta. Um, and then what else did I do? Oh, and then I got, then like the appointments began. So I was like glamming up this birthday, which is hilarious considering that I ended up literally just staying in my flat the whole time. But it's fine. Sometimes it's just nice to feel like bougie. So I got my hair done and then I went to Stockbridge and I got my makeup done and that was all fabulous and great. And then I went back for my flat. Oh my god. Oh, back to my flat with my two friends. One of my friends arrived and the other one was now then with me who were staying the night. One of them being Maisie, and that was so lovely. Um to see them both and we went for dinner. Like the three of us plus my other friend, other best friend, um, and we had a dinner at um this hotel in Edinburgh, which was like okay, but I thought it was gonna be like a French restaurant, but they didn't really have any French dishes, but it was pretty nice. It was just pretty slow service, um, but I had a really nice like starter. It was like this Japanese chicken thing, and then I treated myself to a steak for our main course, which was incredible, and I had a really nice like rhubarb kind of gin cocktail and then we headed back to party the night away and then we want to keep yawning because we really did party the night away so I'm so sorry for yawning so many times um yeah I had so much fun I just had like some friends around for a flat party it was blue themed because um fun fact I was born on blue monday 
So like in 1997, the 20th of January was Blue Monday, statistically the most depressing day of the year. So I thought I'd poke fun at that and have like a blue theme party, wear like these blue trousers. It was a fun time. And um, yeah, it was a late night for sure. Like I don't really do that anymore. Like I haven't really been out in forever or been like out past even at New Year. I think I got home at like half one. It was not late at all and um, I was up till 6 a.m. by the time I like actually went to bed. Everyone probably left like 5, 5.30 which is insane and I realized yesterday that I was up for 24 hours on my birthday because I woke up at 6 for work and I just have to say like who do I think I am? Like I'm still so tired and it's 48 hours later. I just like cannot hack this life anymore. I am too old for this. I'm tapping out but I had so much fun and my parents and my brother came into town today so obviously after my birthday we recorded the podcast and then I literally slept the rest of the weekend essentially and then tried to like clean and from the party and like do work for this week I was supposed to have like other social things but I just like couldn't bring myself to get out of bed if I'm totally honest I was really in struggle city and um I have to say though like minus the tiredness my hangover was really not that bad which I was very happy about because I feel like ever since 25 my hangovers have always been bad so I obviously paced the alcohol quite well which is nice and then yeah my parents and my brother came into town today and we went to a restaurant called um, Muscle Inn I think on Rose Street for dinner and it was really good actually I had this seafood platter which was delicious incredible we're a big seafood family I had like some kind of smoked salmon thing for Maine and we had white wine to share at the table. It was lovely. It was a very nice time. Nice to like have some family time. And yeah, that's kind of the life updates because other that's been like my whole life recently. Um, because other than that, since we last recorded, I've just been working and trying to like get stuff done so I can enjoy this weekend, which I very much did. So yeah, it's it's exciting. I'm now 26. It's a weird time. I always find birthdays like weird I don't know like I love my birthday and I have so much fun but I always feel, feel kind of like weird after them or like during them because I'm like damn like it's just like it really makes you reflect a lot I think I don't know why I think because you're like wow I've been on the earth for like exactly 26 years and I was born like on this day and then you like kind of get like all existential crisis with it and you're like what have I done with my life in those years and like how many years do I have left and what does the rest of my life look like and what do I want it to look like and you just kind of get overwhelmed and like I don't know overthink and stuff and you just kind of look back on previous birthdays as well and you're like whoa like things are so different but not necessarily in a bad way like they're just different and I don't know it's kind of weird because I like look back on it and like I had the best birthday ever and I had so much fun with my friends that I saw and I got like lovely messages from friends I didn't see But it's so weird because, like, growing up, I feel like it was such a, like, popularity contest on your birthday to be, like, oh, my God, I want to get, like, the most Facebook posts or I want to get the most, like, Instagram tags or whatever, like, BS. It was. And now I've just come to value, like, the power of, like, someone wishing you a happy birthday in person and, like, hanging out and being with you in person. I don't know. I just feel like there was such a, like, superficiality to birthdays growing up a lot of the time like especially in the age of social media that we live in um and I used to be like obsessive about like Instagram comments and stuff like that and now like I don't know I'm just not really like that anymore but I still definitely do feel like creeping in sometimes because it's that like intrusive thought you know that I'm very much like working through like 26 of the year of therapy big time um woo shout out to my therapist and um Ah, it's just like an interesting concept and I do think it makes you like really be like okay like I'm so grateful for these people in my life and it's so incredible I have these people in my life but it also makes you like shit like I remember when I had like different people in my life and like now they're not in my life and particularly not really like with friendships ending and stuff like I think like life goes on and like people move and you get new friends and things like that we're just like grieving right I find like that's kind of hard is the whole like I had these family members that I was close to that were really like around and there for my birthday and celebrate it big with me and like I would get a gift from them and things like that and like your birthday is not about gifts but it's just kind of like that weird thing of like you 
one of those times where you really do notice like that they're not there even though it's been like years potentially but I feel like it's one of those moments where it comes back more and I find January to be kind of a hard time to be like happy for my birthday even though like I love my birthday and I want to be happy because everyone else is just like so sad (laughs) and it's hard to like not have that rub off on you and I very much like play off of other people's energies in life so I find that like quite difficult because I really do like January as a month and I try to think of it as a month of like um like a refresh and like it is darker and it's colder and stuff so it's the perfect opportunity to like let your body rest and accept rest and like give in to rest and love rest which is hilarious considering I was just up for 24 hours on my birthday but you know what I'm saying and I think it's hard though not to be impacted by the energies around you And I don't know why, but, like, so many people just, like, are Debbie Downers in January. And I get it. Like, everyone has their own stuff going on. But I'm also, like, so grateful for my friends that are always there for me on my birthday and always, like, show up and support and are, like, happy to be there and don't, like, bring me down. Because that is so hard because I feel like I have definitely had many people in my life who, like, have just kind of drained my energy in multiple ways, but particularly, like, around my birthday and I not even because there was things necessarily going on in their life just because like they aren't a January person which I get but like it was like they couldn't even like bring themselves together to even like figure out a way to attend something for my birthday which was like a hard pill to swallow growing up because like there was so many excuses that people would have as a January baby for your birthday of like why they couldn't make it and things like that and now I'm just realizing like it's important to value who's there and not think about like who's not there and yeah it's kind of ridiculous it's taken me like I wouldn't say I just like realized it this year I think it's like an ongoing realization probably realized it like in the pandemic or something but like it is kind of ridiculous taking me like 26 years to recognize that but also like it's because of the way that things are portrayed in the media and in society like I feel like people have these big like surprise parties and all these tv shows and they have like 300 people there and it's just like so unrealistic so I don't know I just think like I'd rather have and I've always said this but I don't think I've always believed it I'd rather have like less friends not that I have like like I don't have like no friends like I have like quite a lot of friends all things considered like I am a social person I'm not trying to like brag on myself right now which is very much what it sounds like but it's taken me a long time to believe that I would rather have less cl- less friends that are closer than loads of friends and not have like really close relationships with anyone does that make sense like I feel like I'm just babbling now I need to just stop this is what happens when I'm tired I should really go to sleep anyway it's late and I have work tomorrow anyway so those are the updates there that's where my brain's at I guess in life um let's keep going so gem of the city recently I have fallen in love with this little um brunch style restaurant to be fair they might do like dinner and lunch and stuff I've only been there for brunch though called Scran it's like North Bridge area I'm obsessed I've been twice so far but I can't wait to go like a million more times I have had like the yummiest food there I had the most incredible special milkshake they were doing sorry to my IBS that was like biscoff and white chocolate when I had friends in town in December it was so delicious um and their food is just killer the atmosphere is amazing it gives me like cozy energy it's like reasonable prices for Edinburgh and I feel like the service is really quick and they're all the service staff are always like really lovely and I also have like the nicest time so that's my gem of gem in the city right now so like highly recommend you check it out and like stay tuned on the TikTok for me to like post a little video all about Scran and give you all the give you all the the best things on the menu in my opinion so yeah and that our tiktok's just um at fancy up leather okay so for the poem of the week i thought we would delve into a birthday poem naturally it felt very fitting there was some like other poems that i was thinking about but they were all just kind of depressing and i want i wanted like a bittersweet a sweet thing but i couldn't find that and then i was like you know what everyone needs a laugh in january like we don't need depressing poetry in January. So then I was like, let's find like a fun poem instead. So this poem is on the Poetry Foundation, one of my favorite websites, just the poetryfoundation.org. 
And the poem is called Birthday Lights by Caleb Brown. And like I'll link it in the show notes so you can check it out and check out his profile. Um, so here goes. <clears throat> birthday Lights by Caleb Brown. Light bulbs on a birthday cake. What a difference that would make. Plug it in and make a wish, then relax and flip a switch. No more smoke or waxy mess to bother any birthday guest. But Grandpa says, it's not the same. Where's the magic? Where's the flame? To get your wish without a doubt, you need to blow some candles out. Oh, I love this poem so much. That's Birthday Lights by Caleb Brown. Um, so before we hop into the episode with Maisie, which I'm so excited, the episode, the, the chat, we're already in the episode with Maisie, which I'm so excited for you all to listen to, you're all going to fall in love with it. I wanted to let you know my Korean essential. Recently, I have been currying in all the time with my dressing gown. It's an oldie but a goldie. I love my dressing gown. I'm pretty sure mine is like multiple years old, but it's from M&S. And it's like blue with white polka dots on it. I'm obsessed with it. It is the comfiest, coziest thing ever. And I practically live in it. So if you don't have a dressing gown, honestly, I'm not really sure what you're doing with your life at this point because like, I'm, I don't know. That's kind of like weird behavior. Like I don't know anyone that doesn't own a dressing gown. But if you're feeling, if you feel like your dressing gown is underused, it is, it is time to change that. It will upgrade your life so drastically. Every time I come home, the first thing I do before I had nudie, because now it kind of like fluctuates. Well, I have like a knockoff beauty. Kind of like fluctuates between the two. But like I will take off my clothes and put on my dressing gown. Like without a doubt. It's just it's just what has to happen. I'm going out somewhere. I'll wear my dressing gown until I leave. At my birthday party, I literally was wearing my dressing gown when people arrived. Even though like I had a nice iPhone underneath because I just love it. Okay. So if you don't have one, get one. If you have one, show it some love. Because that is what we are carrying in with right now. Hello, I am just hopping in here for our charity of the week. Um, naturally for charity of the week this week, I wanted to think of something that's like really close and pure to my heart. Um, because it it is like technically my birthday episode. So I wanted to make sure it was something that like really, like all the charities obviously like resonate with me, but I wanted it to be something that like really made sense for like my brand, I guess. So I picked the charity Edinburgh's Children's Hospital Charity. Um, I'm sure that most of you know that, um, or all of you know, I would presume if you listen to the podcast this far, that I'm a primary school teacher as my full-time job. And as a result, obviously, I adore children. I think they're like the most pure, wonderful beings placed on the earth. And I'm so grateful that I get to spend five days a week with them. Um, And yeah, I don't know. They just like, I just think they matter so much. And I think that having a children's hospital is so important, so crucial And I think like the impact being in hospital can have on a child is so can well it will be so memorable in their experience. It's important that they get the treatment that they deserve in like multiple ways, not just in like terms of like for the the health of their body, but also like the health of their mind and their well being. So Edinburgh's Children's Hospital Charity um, has the vision of child first, patient second. And that is at the heart of everything they do. And they believe that nothing should get in the way of being a child, which I think is just such an important thing to remember. I think I am very fortunate I was not very ill as a child. And um, I think that being so unwell as a child can really have such an impact on your life. And it's so important that these children still get to have the childhood that everyone else is, is given and blessed with. So, yeah, absolutely pleased to go and check them out. So their website is just echcharity.org and there you can find out more about what they do who they are you can get involved in multiple ways whether that's like um sharing your story uh fundraising donating volunteering finding out about different events going on perhaps like start setting up a corporate partnership leaving a gift in your will getting involved in like philanthropy um and they also have a shop that you can check out if you'd like to support them that way 
Um, but it is currently closed right now, but I think it will be opening again soon. So yeah, like I said, it is ECHC. Oh, sorry, echcharity.org. So go ahead and check them out. Hello, Maisie, and welcome to Fancy a Ballet Podcast. How are you today? Hello, I am good. Thank you for having me on. You're welcome. I feel like we should start off this by like explaining how we know each other and like introduce yourself a little bit. Like, what do you do? What are you about? Kind of thing. Well, we kind of grew up together because we lived in the same village um, when we were kids, and my mum was actually your childminder, so you spent a lot of time at my house um, when we, we were did. little. Um, and then when we were in school together, we had like a few years uh, age gap between us. So we weren't ever in the same class, but we still organized a lot of things together. We uh, did an art fair every couple of years <laughs> for charity. <laughs> um, I still don't know how we got away with that, but we did it. Selfless individuals. Um, um, yeah, and then when I was nine, I moved to Australia with my family. So we hadn't seen each other for quite a long time. But coming back every couple of years to see my friends and family again. So we just stayed in touch through that. Um, and now I'm back in Scotland kind of long term so nice that. wait so let's like rewind so you moved when you were nine mm -hmm. what what was that like do you remember it like do you remember move because obviously like I don't know I feel like that's an age where you do remember some things but it's probably like a little bit blurry like what do you remember about it I actually remember it super super clearly um because mm. I really didn't want to move to Australia like I was super against it I think because I had really strong roots here with like my family and my grandparents and my like all my friends like, yeah close with. um so yeah I remember very much like when we moved over I like made it a point to like refuse to enjoy anything about Australia like I didn't like going to the beach and I didn't like the sun and everything um, and it took a while for me to be like, okay, it's actually really amazing here. But <laughs> I was really stubborn in the beginning. How does like even the logistics of that work, like moving from here to Australia, is obviously like a crazy long flight and stuff. Like, do you take any belongings with you or do you like, do your parents sell everything and like buy most things there or like, how did that work? Well, my parents actually did take basically everything that they owned over there. Um, but I think if they were to do it again now, they wouldn't do it that way. They would probably sell everything here. And yeah. then I knew when we moved over. Um, because what happened is all of our furniture and everything that we shipped over it came like by boat um, on shipping containers. And it took um, a really long time. I can't remember exactly how long, but I remember we were like in a rental and we still didn't have any furniture. Um, and we were just waiting for things to arrive. So we just had like mattresses on the floor and things like that for a while. And um, so I think if they were going to do like a giant move like that again, they probably would just get rid of everything and just sort sort out new things, um, even if it yeah. was secondhand and things like that when you get to the new country. Yeah, that's pretty, cr that is crazy. That is a long way to, is, to, to yeah. travel with like furniture and stuff. Yeah. Do you remember like moving, like starting at the new school? Because obviously before then you'd been at the same primary school like the whole time so you hadn't really been like the new kid because you we all started like you started primary one at the same time as everyone else do you remember that experience of like being the new kid in the school yeah um, and it was kind of hard because when I was a kid like obviously I had a really strong Scottish accent and I used to talk yeah. really really quickly as well um, and I had a bit of a lisp so I think the Australian kids just fully could not understand me half of the time like when I was trying <laughs> to talk to them I would just get these like blank looks sometimes um, so yeah, because I'd never had to like really make friends as a kid living in Scotland mm -hmm. because I just had friends like for as long as I could remember I had like, you know, the, the people that I'd always kind of been around and then all of a sudden I was like in this new country and I had to kind of actually like work on like making people like me and getting to know people um, and I did find it pretty hard to be honest Um I guess my accent just sort of faded over time and I did make like some really wonderful friends over there. Nice. And you were saying before that when you first got there, you were like determined not to enjoy it. So yeah. how did you kind of start to enjoy it? Like, do you remember the moment or like mm. certain moments where you were like, oh, actually, maybe like this is not so bad? I don't think I had like a lightning kind of moment. I think like even like years after we moved there, like when I was a teenager, I still had this feeling of like wanting to be back in Scotland and kind of like wishing that I hadn't had to like leave all my friends mm -hmm. and family behind and stuff. But I think like even when I was a kid and we first moved over, I was always really into like the ocean and swimming and trying to surf and things like that. 
So I think that was one of the main things that kind of like grounded me and made me mm. feel like happy then was that we were always by the beach and um, yeah, even like right up until me leaving back in May, I was always at the beach if I could be. So nice. What would you say were like the biggest cultural differences, or even like even now, like obviously because now you've kind of been back and forth. What are the big? Because obviously we all speak the same language, but obviously like you were saying, the accents are different. Mm-hmm. But what were, what are the other like? Obviously the weather is very different. But what are the other like cultural things that you noticed, like over time? That's actually like a really difficult one. I'm trying to think. All I can think, I feel like Australian people swear a lot more. Oh really? I think so. That's interesting. I feel like Scottish people swear a lot. But then, yeah, I do feel like Scottish people swear a lot as well, actually. So maybe that's not true. Maybe it's about equal. To be fair as well, where I live in Western Australia, I think um, it's got like one of the highest like British people populations. And it is. Uh, Okay. So it's quite similar. Yeah. But it's also really diverse and multicultural. Like I think a lot more than where I lived here in Scotland. Yeah. It's such a small town. Um, whereas where I moved to in Australia, I went from this primary school in Scotland that had like a hundred kids maybe to this mm. primary school that had like 700 kids and an additional needs center like attached to it. So it was like lots and lots of different kids and then kids with different needs and things like that. Yeah. And so I think probably like the diversity and the multiculturalism is like something that stands out to me. I just feel like it's a very, very diverse place to live and grow up. Yeah, definitely. Because I also think like there's also the added kind of thing of like obviously the history of Australia being like a colony and things like that. And then you have like Aboriginals, yeah. whereas like in Scotland that doesn't exist. Like there isn't, there, obviously there is people that lived here before, like we were part of Britain and stuff like that. But yeah. because we were never a colony, like there's not really like indigenous people to Scotland because like, they're yeah. still living in Scotland now, you know, yeah. and they're still respected in Scotland. Yeah. Was there any kind of education on that? in school was there any kind of did they talk about like aboriginal things was like the culture part of like your education or was it kind of like something that wasn't spoken about a lot or what was that kind of like this is something that i'm actually like super passionate about like as a like future teacher as well yeah um because i think like we did learn in primary school like bits about like aboriginal culture and Mm -hmm. history but not really enough I would say and not really like it it wasn't done well enough like I think if I look back a lot of it kind of comes across as kind of tokenistic and like not actually Mm -hmm. meaningful learning which is such a shame because like Aboriginal cultures and histories are just like so rich and so diverse like within Australia there was over 200 Indigenous nations like Mm -hmm. it was kind of like it wasn't one country it was more like Europe where it's made up of heaps of different Mm -hmm. countries and different people and languages all the different tribes yeah yeah and um, they had so much, like, no, I mean, obviously, it's, like, the oldest living culture, and they just had so much, like, knowledge um, and understanding of the country and things like that. And there's so many ways that we can, like, incorporate that into education. Mm-hmm. I think that's really important. But it wasn't until um, I was in university and I was studying, I had to do a unit on, like, indigenous, um, indigenous cultures and histories um, as part of my teaching degree and looking at, like, like really looking in detail like how they were treated when like white people kind of came over and mm-hmm. colonized the country it was just like so horrendous um and yeah that, that was really the first time that I was like properly learning about it um and I think like obviously you know there's only so much that you can kind of like teach to children but I mm-hmm. think in my school you know we should definitely have been looking at that in more detail oh yeah absolutely yeah that's really interesting because I feel like that's the thing with like being here and teaching obviously like I teach as well and the thing with like which is quite funny that like how we both ended up doing that yeah. but, um but being here there's kind of no talk ever like growing obviously because I ended up being at school all the way through mm. in this country I've never moved like I have lived other countries but I'm I spent like all 13 years in the school system here and like there was no I never remember learning about colonialism I never remember yeah. learning about like all these things and I think like there's a a big thing like problem in Britain for that because it's like because we are the problem right so it's like well we don't want to talk about our bad history we'll just like sweep that under the carpet and we'll just like not mention it and like if we talk about I remember in high school distinctively remembering in history like higher history so it was like quite like it's kind of like the second last year you're at school Mm -hmm. learning so you're like 16 you're capable of learning like more intense things and um I remember specifically learning about the civil rights movement in America yeah. and I thought it was so interesting because then obviously as I got older I started to look more into like 
racism in this country and like civil rights here and like there was a civil rights movement in Britain mm -hmm. but we never spoke about it at school and I was yeah. like that's so crazy the only kind of Scottish based history that we ever did but they somehow missed colonialism out of it yeah. was when they spoke about like immigrants and um exiles which was really interesting because they were talking about like the highland clearances in that time uh -huh. period and like the potato famine in Ireland and that's actually super relevant to colonialism that all kind of Mer that's all the same time period mm -hmm. and I don't think like that's an excuse but I think that makes it more complex in terms of why the different countries were involved in the situations yeah. and like the way that perhaps like people who were picks or like lived in the highlands up north like the impact it had on their culture and the impact that's still happening on our culture today in terms of like Gaelic not really being recognized really as a language yeah. until more recently like my gran was grew up in the highlands and she was told never to speak gaelic mm -hmm. because it was kind of frowned upon and her parents could both speak it but they refused to teach her it because it was like oh if you speak this it'll look really bad and you'll get hired and things like that it's just so interesting there was like a stripping of culture as well yeah but it was done in like a more in a more like subtle way i suppose because it wasn't like there was never like a big well, obviously there was big battles in the past but like at that point there wasn't like a big thing it just kind of happened because yeah. it was like one royal was like oh yeah we'll join you and that's saying don't remember there ever being like there wasn't like a public vote like yeah. should we join Britain and all this stuff so I think that's interesting but for me it was when I moved to Canada for one semester abroad at uni so at this point I'm like turning 21 and I, was, I obviously at this point knew what colonialism was just through like being in the real world but mm. I didn't really know a lot about it and there had never been much of a discussion about it and this is three years into like my English literature degree mm -hmm. And I decided to take a um, post-colonial literature class in Canada. And that for me was like a really eye-opening moment because being in Canada and having that was such an interesting like discourse because obviously I had never been in a country where they had like indigenous people and where that was the discussion. Yeah. And I was like, God, like this is crazy. Like, why is this not something that we're like more aware of mm -hmm. in our culture? Because it's so prevalent still in the world today yeah. is like, everything that's happened since colonialism I mean there is still literally colonies so it's still happening and I just think it's so crazy that there was never any discussion on it or anything like that and it was so interesting for me like being able to read like books that were speaking about this different themes and things like that and it's something I've like tried to bring in a lot more when I do discuss things like with my with my class I try to be like more like big picture and be like well let's be honest about like who our country were Mm -hmm. who we are and obviously it's not like I think that's the thing in Britain is people are like oh well we can't talk about that as in like the society like we can't talk about that because that makes us look bad or that's embarrassing and all mm -hmm. this stuff but I'm like but like you also have to accept that that's just the way it was yeah and like I don't think these people want your guilt they just want like they just want to be like seen and also I feel like there's so much more of a discussion that could be happening here that just doesn't happen I suppose it's a lot more complex as well because the royal family are still very much like a lot well obviously not all of them but like they're still very much alive and around in our culture uh -huh. and cemented in our culture yeah. in a way that I don't know that any other country is mm -hmm. but it's like the queen is still technically the queen of Australia no that's so weird well no she's not the king, <laughs> the, king. <laughs> the king it's not yeah. it's just like so yeah. weird yeah is still like the king of Australia and I'm like that's just like I don't get it like yeah. it's the 21st century yeah. so it's like a really interesting concept yeah. how did you get into teaching had you always kind of wanted to teach was that something that kind of came around naturally was it something that you like pivoted to like what was that journey like well I didn't um initially go into teaching when I started at uni I was doing a film and screenwriting uh, degree which I really, I did enjoy and I thought it was fun, um, but I only kind of had, went at that for a year and then I decided that it wasn't really what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think probably part of that is because like my mum's always worked in education and she's always said to me like, you know, you'll, you'll be a teacher and you'll end up kind of doing the same thing as me. And I think I was just like <laughs> being stubborn in a way. I was yeah. like, no, <laughs> I'll choose my own destiny. Um, but I do think I was just always meant to work with kids. And it was actually, I was working in a McDonald's, that was my first job. Um, and I managed to wrangle it that I held like a kids club every weekend and every Sunday oh, wow. morning these kids would come in and we would do like arts and craft and That's so cool. just play activities and stuff. But it was really nice. And we had like regulars basically, like there were these kids that would come in mm -hmm. and, and 
was yeah just it was like a free thing yeah was it was free no, yeah like just amazing kind of to like build a bit of a sense of community mm -hmm. it was really good and there was actually this one little boy and um, i would have been 18 or 19 at this point um but like one of the terms and conditions of me having this kids club is that i had to kind of do like you know like themes and stuff for like whatever mm -hmm. was happening and it was coming up to australia day uh, which is january 26th which um, I really do not celebrate at all now. Um, but basically, Australia Day on the 26th of January, that's when Australia was colonized. Oh. Um, so it's been for indigenous people for like hundreds of years, it's been known as kind of like a real day of mourning and a really like, yeah. sad day um, because of all the pain and everything that followed that, that happening. Um, but there are groups of people who are very like firm on Australia Day being like something to celebrate. But really, it's just an excuse for people to basically get drunk and yeah. <laughs> not really think about what they're celebrating um, so much. Um, anyway, but at the time, I did like make these like Australia-themed activities for the day. Um, and something I didn't even think about, like I printed out just as a little colouring in activity, like Australian flags. And one of the little boys that came in, he was he was Aboriginal. And he, he coloured in the flag and then he turned it over and he drew like the Aboriginal flag on the back of it. And mm -hmm. I hadn't even thought, like like looking back, at, I mean, I was very young at the time as well, but I just hadn't even thought like it's Australia Day and I'm literally just celebrating, like, well, giving them the opportunity to celebrate like the widest version of this. And I had these kids that would come every week um, and I hadn't even thought about, you know, what that day means to them and their culture. And yeah. So that was like a really eye-opening moment. Um, but yeah, I love doing that kids club and I think that's why that was kind of like part of it that made mm -hmm. me realize I wanted to work with kids all the time. Um, but, you know, those kids in particular, that little boy and his sister, I think are why I feel so passionate about um, Indigenous education mm -hmm. and sharing like cultures and histories. I think when we don't have education about those kind of things, it just lets people be ignorant. And when people are ignorant, it's so easy to, you know, just believe you know, stereotypes and fall into prejudices and things like that. So I think like educating people is so important to stop that kind of like racist cycle going on. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think so. I think education is such like a fundamental tool to have in the world that's kind of like so misused so often in terms of like the history books that you used to see and things like that. It's all now it's like interesting to look back and be like, who was the author of that? Like what whose perspective was that? But no, that's um. I actually <laughs> that was also someone who like they say people would always say, "Oh, you'll be a teacher when you're older. You'll do yeah. that." And I remember being like, "No, nah. mm -hmm. it's just because I didn't like being told what I was gonna do with my life. It was literally <laughs> yeah. that stubborn thing." Yeah. It's the same when like my parents asked me to wash the dishes, and I'm like, "I was gonna do it, but now that yeah, now that you've asked me, I want to. I don't want to." <laughs> and I said, "That's a terrible way to be." Yeah. That's exactly how I feel. But no, that's such an interesting thing. So then. Is there kind of like in teaching something in particular, like is there a particular group of children that you're keen to work with or like schools that you're keen to work in or just kind of like teaching in general? I mean, I do seem to gravitate like when I've been on practicum placements and when I was working in a school last year, I do seem to like gravitate towards kids who have um, additional needs, mm. um, usually kind of like social and emotional needs that aren't being met. Um, because I just really feel for them. And I think they're really misunderstood sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, just like a quick little story, like on my first prep placement or my second one, maybe, uh, there was this young kid and he would have been like eight or nine and he had really high emotional needs um, and like anger management issues. And I feel like he'd already been written off by the teachers in the school that he was just like really like troublesome. Mm -hmm. and just like, you know, like he was just like a problem kid because he would have these meltdowns and outbursts. Um, and we were making fairy bread, which is, do you know what fairy bread is? Yeah, I think yeah. it's the one with the um, <laughs> the sprinkles. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's white bread with a lot of butter and a lot of um, sprinkles, or so hundreds and thousands. And so the kids have been learning how to write like instructions. And one of the instructions that they did was a recipe to make fairy bread. And then oh, they nice. were following their own recipes to make fairy bread. Mm -hmm. And so I was going around, my job was to actually butter the bread for them because the teachers didn't want them to have the knives. Mm -hmm. And as I was going around, this kid and I started talking and I was um, buttering the bread of the kid next to him. And while I was talking to him and we were having a really nice conversation, I actually accidentally like completely bypassed him and didn't do his bread and moved on to the next kid. 
like would never do that on purpose it was just i think because we were talking i felt like i'd already done it yeah it makes sense yeah i was already like five kids down the road and someone was like oh miss you you didn't do his his bread and i looked at him and he was like hands like balled up into fists and like completely red in the face and like tears in his eyes and like shaking like he was so so upset and i like just felt awful and i went over to him and i just like knelt down and got to his like eye level and just said like i'm so sorry like i really didn't do that on purpose and i explained like why i had done it i think because we were talking and i just felt like yeah bad. and literally that was all it took i just apologized to him and i explained myself and i you know didn't act like he was overreacting or anything like that and he de-escalated me came right down and it was fine and later on um, at the end of the day i was telling my mentor teacher about it and i said like i felt so bad and i explained it to her and she kind of just rolled her eyes and she was like oh man like don't even give him like the time of day sort of thing like don't oh, even yeah, you know God. like yeah. as if i was you know too soft on him because i apologize and you know explain myself um and i think that's that is actually another cultural difference i think in australia there are a lot more like you'll be right kind of thing with the kids like if kids kind of fall over yeah <clears throat> i think from what i remember <clears throat> jesus christ <laughs> 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 I think from what I remember, like growing up here, I think the teachers were very um, like gentle and kind of, yeah. you know, um, but I think in Australia it's a lot more, you know, about, I think the idea is like to build resilience, but I do think resilience, you but need there's only, emotional support. For yeah, that. exactly. You know, building resilience is uh, like, it's something you learn Yeah, and it does take time. And like, for instance, like I had a poetry competition recently with my kids and one of them didn't win. And obviously like that's a hard pill to swallow. Uh -huh. And they've all worked so hard but in life like you only one person wins a competition yeah but it's not like i was like oh well you'll be fine when she was upset about it i spoke to her and i was like look you did an incredible job yeah i'm really proud of everything you've done and you should be so proud of yourself mm -hmm. but unfortunately like this time you didn't win you might win next time but i wasn't coming to her like well you'll be fine <laughs> not yeah. gonna talk to you <laughs> like yeah. i think it's about that make reassuring and then giving them yeah. the space because i do yeah. think they also do need the space to be like I just need a minute yeah. to compose myself and I get that I feel the same way like if somebody's like gives me bad news and then they're like well are you okay I'm like you just told me something crap like give yeah. me five minutes yeah. to pull myself together yeah. so I think that's such a such a good point so it is and I do think though even here though I think there's so many children who are just misunderstood yeah and I think it's like people just don't have and it sounds terrible but in some ways I, I, I try my best obviously not to misunderstand people whenever possible and to resolve it whenever possible but one of the big issues is that there almost isn't the time sometimes which sounds awful but when you've got a class of 30 kids yeah sometimes it's like you don't realize what's happened uh -huh. and whenever you can you rectify it but i do think sometimes that slips through the cracks yeah because because you're not there's not enough resources or enough people available mm -hmm. And I do think, because I even know some kids I've worked with who are just misunderstood, but I think it's really interesting because I think as like a generalization, but I think as like a generational thing, we're a lot more willing to be wrong than yeah. like the generations before us. Like mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with being wrong. I don't have a problem with being uncomfortable. And I do find some people that I've worked with in the past, not everyone, but like I would say is typically people that are older than me that I've worked with in the past that really struggle with, yeah. being wrong mm -hmm. and even if they kind of knew they were wrong they're like ah well it doesn't matter whereas yeah. if I do something and I'm like oh my god what was I doing like I literally did something where I'd taken like a piece of curriculum stuff from this um site that we use to do with my class but I, it was in English year groups and I'd gotten confused of like what their year group equals okay. to my year group uh -huh. and we'd accidentally done the one like the year group above us uh, okay. and I and to be fair my class did pretty well considering yeah. and I was thinking god this seems quite tricky like why would they be learning this but at this point I was like oh maybe it's just me and then I went back and looked the next day and I was like oh god I've been it's the wrong year group it's the one <laughs> above them so I went in the next day and I said to them yeah don't worry if you didn't understand that yesterday yeah if you did absolutely amazing or even if you just understood some of it that's amazing but you actually don't learn that until next year yeah. I was like that's my fault I looked at the wrong thing mm -hmm. but well done for sticking with it and for trying and being part of that challenge but like I will hold my hands up and say I'm so sorry yeah. we've done something way more challenging than it should have been and I think for them that was a really nice moment because yeah. they were like oh it's like okay to be wrong and it's yeah, okay it's to make so mistakes for them to see like adults be 
be able to take oh, yeah. and apologize and a lot of them probably actually won't get that from their parents yeah well. absolutely so i think for teachers like being able to say sorry and admit when they were wrong or they made a mistake and just you know be human with them i think that's yeah that's so, oh so i think it makes such a massive difference i think it's also just like being able to see that adults make mistakes is so important as well because mm -hmm. it lets them feel like oh i can make a mistake yeah. Yeah. I it's not wrong for me to do that because otherwise they kind of feel like they've got to live up to this expectation yeah. and then that's so much pressure to even put yeah. on an adult never mind a child so I think that's so interesting mm -hmm. when you started like coming back what was that like what was it like like the first time you came back what was that experience of like visiting back to like the place obviously that you'd lived for the first nine years of your life and then obviously the the clock keeps ticking even when you're away so I can imagine like it must have been quite a weird to be back in the same place yeah it is strange I mean like when I came back the first time I was I think I was 14 years mm. old and I flew back by myself um because my parents and my brothers at the time weren't in, really interested in coming back yeah and um, so it was just something that I did and I just flew over um so that was a pretty big thing to do because it's about 24 hours of travel by myself um and then yeah being back in like like particularly like being back in like the village where I grew up and going to mm -hmm. see my old house and um, that was weird and I think at the time I was still struggling a bit with homesickness and not really knowing like where I belonged and where I wanted to be and um, I hadn't like fully settled into Australia even then like five years later and um, so yeah I think it was a really good thing for me to do because it made me realize like it's not impossible like I can I can still see the people that I care about like my friends and my family like it's not impossible to like you know stay in contact with them and visit them and um, I think it probably was like kind of confusing as well because it was just like I don't know I think I really really enjoyed being here on that trip and probably made it a little bit harder Part to back. go home yeah. yeah yeah do you kind of feel like it almost is a bit of an identity thing like an identity crisis thing where it's like you don't know which what obviously both are part of your identity but it you do kind of especially when you're younger feel the need to kind of fit yourself into a box so you fit in with everyone else and do you feel like being between the two places and not knowing which one was kind of like hard to be like oh I, I don't know if like I want to be do I belong here or do I belong there do you think that was like something that was hard for you like with identity as well I'm not too sure like I would say that was really a big part of it when I was younger and I mm -hmm. actually I really enjoy now that I'm older like having the the dual citizenship and being yeah, say, of course. I'm Scottish and Australian um, and I really switch it up as well like depending on where I am like I was working um, on the Isle of Skye a few months ago um, and every time we had like American guests come in and um, I would talk to them and I would tell them that I was Australian and I would tell them about Australia and things like that mainly so that I wouldn't have to recommend whiskey to them because yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know anything about whiskey. Okay, well, you can, you can message my dad if you need any tips. <laughs> but if we had um, Scottish guests come in, I would be like, oh, I'm from Perth, and I would tell them, you know, about, you know, my Scottish yeah. side instead, and, and then they would always kind of query the accent, and I would explain that I've, you know, spent a lot of time in Australia as well. Um, but, yeah, like, I don't, I don't really think it was so much of an identity thing for me when I was younger. Mm -hmm. It was just that I really missed my friends and my family and I, I guess like the way that life was when I was a kid as well because it always like changes when you're growing up and, mm -hmm. and I think like I had like a really really nice like upbringing in Scotland I think like growing up in the village and having so much kind of like outdoor learning and yeah like, definitely learning and like I just remember so much of it just in like such a really lovely way so I think that was what was harder for me and I think it is kind of nice and comforting although when you look back on it sometimes you realize kind of the the gaps in your in your knowledge of the world uh -huh. being in like the insul insular community mm -hmm. but I think there is something kind of comforting about a village compared to yeah. anywhere else that yeah. I definitely think for me is kind of why I love going home because I can get back to that but I also have had to like grow up and take myself out of that and be like oh that was kind of like a small world view yeah definitely. but sometimes I think it is nice it's comforting mm -hmm. to be from a place where everyone knows everyone sometimes it's not comforting sometimes yeah. <laughs> it's a little annoying but yeah. but like where everyone knows everyone it's almost like if something happened mm -hmm. you would always know that there was people who would be like there yeah the people that would kind of pitch in and help your family out and things yeah. like that whereas like in a city I don't know if you ever get the same experience my friend has this theory kind of uh, that when you're in small towns um, and you're walking down the street everyone that you see will like smile at you and say hello and ask yeah. how you're going 
Um, and you just don't get that in cities um, because there's just too many people for everyone to kind of care about in a way. So people, yeah. I think, just focus more on themselves. And it's not to say that people in cities are, like, selfish or, like, don't care about other people. It's but just I think a there's, different like, environment, that isn't it? Community to be fair, that. that is, though, a thing I do like about Edinburgh is, like, it feels kind of more like a village than a city sometimes. Yeah. Like, I do kind of get that. I do think I do sometimes still get the city atmosphere and I think it's funny that I lived in a village my whole life and then moved to a city mm -hmm. and I can't imagine living in a village and I think it is one of those things of like you always want the opposite of what you had yeah um but then I also do think a lot of the time when I walk around Edinburgh people smile at you and like say good morning or if like you're on a walk especially like right. in the area I live in yeah there's kind of an area where I go for runs and people go for dog walks and often everyone kind of says hi and stuff and I think that for me was something that made Edinburgh stick out as a place I could live in yeah because I was like although this is a city and I think it was probably the family ties help but although this is a city it has that kind of small town feel that I need whereas that when I lived in like Toronto for a little while I found that incredibly difficult uh -huh. because that was that city where like you're lucky if anyone well no one's anything but your eyes were covered because it was so cold but like <laughs> but it was like no one was really like communicating and it was like you could walk past like you could be walking around the city all day and not say one word yeah and it, or maybe like unless you went to like a cafe and then even then it was very kind of small chats whereas I think that's something I've always loved about I don't know if it is an Edinburgh thing or if it's just a Scotland thing because I do get a lot from people who come here they always say god like everyone's so friendly here uh -huh. And I think there's, we just kind of like to chat as a nation. Mm -hmm. Like we're a nation that enjoys like a small talk chat, like in the cafe or like at the bus stop. Yeah. Like I know some people hate that, but I think as a country, we seem to be a country that quite enjoys that. Like I love, not always, but I quite enjoy a chat like at the bus stop. I literally had a man yeah. once give me a poem from oh. his bag that he'd been writing, this old man, because we started chatting about poetry and he was like, oh, I actually write my own poetry. And I was like, that's this would so never sweet. happen in like London or yeah. Yeah. Toronto so I think that's something that's really interesting yeah. about this being a capital yeah is because we are a smaller nation I think there's kind mm -hmm. of a different camaraderie perhaps yeah. and I also I think it probably does have something to do like with the way that we are presented yeah. to the rest of the world it probably is that thing of like an understanding that we have so it is an interesting an interesting concept so when you decided to come back here so obviously now you've been living here for a bit what how did you come what was that kind of like when did you decide to move and be like oh I want to live or come some come to Scotland for a year or two and work and things like that how did you come to that decision well I think it was really a combination of things obviously through um like all the travel bans that were going on mm -hmm. during the pandemic um those like Western Australia in particular was really quite like strict with that so um, basically, if I had have left, I wouldn't have been able to come back um, for, you know, a really long time until the borders opened. But when that all sort of relaxed and the borders did open back up, um, I hadn't seen my grandparents and my family and my friends mm -hmm. here for like five years, really. Um, so it was just like when the borders opened up and I knew that I'd be able to get back home if I needed to, I was like, okay, I'm going to go to Scotland. And I just booked a one-way ticket and I really had like no idea how long I was going to be here for it was just sort of I just wanted to get out and travel again and see people that I hadn't seen for a long time um, and then it just so ended up that when I came over here I just really was happy and really enjoying myself and then I met my partner who I live with now so that's <laughs> that was also an unexpected kind of turn so mm -hmm. yeah yes yeah, so it wasn't really like a you know decision that I was just going to move back to Scotland I just was ready to you know get out of Australia for a little bit and see my family again and how was that? Um, obviously, you were here in winter mm. for a while, and obviously, Australian winter and Scottish winter could not be like more different Literally. if they if they tried. Yeah. So, how was that experience? Because obviously, you had probably become quite accustomed, especially your body, to like living in a warmer climate. Yeah, yeah and then sure. obviously the winters here, especially this year, mm. have been have been very very cold, yeah. especially this month. To be fair, last couple of weeks. Yeah. have been Baltic which for people listening if they don't know just means cold in Scottish so um what what was that kind of like was that a shock to your system I think a little bit but I guess because I didn't just come over in winter in like the mm -hmm. dead of winter from you know like an Australian summer into winter 
I came over in May, so it was... So you kind of had time to... Yeah, like, I've been here as it's gradually gotten colder, so I've kind of had time to, you know, like, buy warmer winter clothes. Mm -hmm. And, like, for Christmas, like, I just got so many, like, thermal... Like, I've got thermal leggings and socks and tops and jackets and everything for my family because I've been so worried that I'm just going to (laughs) get hypothermia or something. And so I think I've, like, handled it fine. Like, sometimes I do feel cold, but it's not really, like, as bad as I would have expected. Um, and the other day, like, I stepped out of the house and it was four degrees. And this was after that, like, really cold snap where it's yes. really heavily. And it was four degrees and I walked outside and I was like, oh, my God, it's warm today. And then I was like, what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> like, I can't even imagine what it would be like if it was four degrees in, in Australia. Like, yeah, the whole part. country would, like, shut down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, but, um, no, I've been enjoying it. I think the only thing is, like, I do feel, like, my my skin and my hair have kind of, like, suffered a little bit. Mm-hmm. And the water change will be, like... I suppose so, yeah, that as well. And, yes, like, I've had, like, eczema flare-ups that I haven't really had to deal with for a really long time. My hair's been, like, damaged, I think, from the cold as well. So that's, you know, like, minor issues, but it's kind of a pain. But it is something that is interesting because I think people don't really think about it. Because mm-hmm. I think it does play a part in even, like... The water that's in the shower is different and like your uh-huh. body gets used to that yeah and then when you move somewhere it, it changes and then it's like oh like this was not part of the plan yeah but um so did you you spent christmas here right i did yeah so was this your first christmas without your family or have you had them like have you had christmases without like as in like your household family so like your parents yeah. and your siblings is this your first well I've actually I've done it once before because okay. I think in 2015 I was here for Christmas okay and I stayed with my grandparents and my auntie and my cousins then yeah as well. so basically the same as what yeah it's last Christmas um but you know it is kind of hard like especially I think like my mum and me we were normally like kind of like the most Christmassy people in the house yeah like, the ones like putting up the tree together and drinking Baileys and putting Christmas movies on and um, so I think probably we've both like struggled a little bit with that like this year that um I wasn't there to kind of do all of that with her um, and at the time as well I was working in a hotel so I wasn't even with my family literally until like Christmas day mm-hmm. so I didn't really get to do all the Christmas kind of like warm-up stuff like you know decorating a tree and watching yeah. movies and stuff with family so so yeah it's been, it was like a little bit of a strange Christmas and I think as well because it was so cold on Christmas that it's something that feels kind of weird to me now like normally that's one of the hottest days of the year and would be by the pool or maybe even at the beach and things like that mm-hmm. so yeah definitely different and then in Australia did you have Christmas just the five of you or would you have other people come around was it quite a like social event or was it just kind of like with your family or would you guys like meet up with friends to go to the beach or what was kind of like your traditions well we usually would just do Christmas just like the five of us mm-hmm. um, but then we had this thing that we called Boxing Day Christmas with these really good uh, family friends of ours mm-hmm. um, and they the reason that we knew them is when we first moved over, my little brother was in uh, in a class with their eldest child, um, and then they have a younger son as well. So the four of them and the five of us would do like a Christmas, uh, usually the day after Christmas. Yeah. Um, and we would just do like a big secret Santa instead of buying everybody a present each. And we would mm-hmm. always change the It was so nice. Like we would all bring like, you know, we would contribute different foods and stuff, and sometimes there would be things but with the secret Santa as well, sometimes there would be rules. So like one year we had to get everything from like a charity shop. And, mm-hmm. and yeah, it's just, it was so much fun. Like that was a really good tradition that we had and they still have. I just wasn't here for it this year. No, that's cool. Yeah. Cause we've always just done Christmas. We used to be six and now we're four, but mm-hmm. um, we've always just had kind of like small family yeah. thing. And it's kind of funny, like, cause I've never not had, although I've lived abroad and done all those things, I've somehow managed to wangle it that I've never not been here for Christmas. Yeah. Which is funny because to me, I, it's funny like that it was the, the hottest day of the year because to me, Christmas is like all about like my dad putting the fire on in the uh-huh. living room, yeah. like everyone having like a hot chocolate or like a getting like a coffee in the morning, just like from the kitchen and then like not really leaving the house, just being like in your blanket all day. Mm-hmm having like recent in the last like five or six years like having the neighbor's cat around all day and just like very like cozy Mm -hmm. just like kind of you know those like pinterest board things of like people with their cozy socks on near the fire and things like that like that's how they encapsulate our family christmas it's a very like cozy quiet thing which i think is funny because like i think growing up i kind of didn't i i wasn't i i think i did i did like it but like Growing up, I was always kind of aware of, like, bigger families. 
and the yeah. Christmases they had and the more like and the big traditions they had and things like that and I never really thought about like the things my family did were tradition but like we have the same food every year and things like that so we do have traditions but like it's yeah. funny because now I like, couldn't imagine having a big Christmas like that to me now just sounds like horrible like I love yeah. that I have a small cozy quiet Christmas I'm like that is exactly what I need and yeah. I think for me it's nice because in teaching they're the one of the best things about teaching is because you were saying working in a hotel obviously you didn't get all the kind of run up to Christmas things yeah one of the best things about teaching is like you really get so much of the run up to Christmas things yeah, absolutely. all the yeah. time with the kids and yeah. I think that kind of is almost like my busy Christmas yeah so then it's nice to go home and just kind of decompress and be like okay and then being in Edinburgh it's like quite a good like place to be in the festive season and people are always like up for like going to see a Christmas film or like going ice skating or going like to the Christmas markets even like overpriced and overrated but like you just go to see you being yeah so it's interesting because I think I always was kind of like when I was younger oh I don't know if like I want something that's like a little bit more exciting but speaking about like being cozy and things like that because we're gonna have to round off the episode because we chan for a while and <laughs> um, what is like your curry and essential so what is something that you you like to have if you would only have like one thing all the time that would be like your thing to make you feel like cozy and warm inside like what would it be at this point I think I have um really poor circulation actually to my feet uh -huh. and it's just a fun fact for everybody and um, so I basically always have cold feet like right now I'm wearing these thermal socks and my feet are cold and um, so for me it's like those ridiculous giant bed socks that are like just massive and like so unnecessary and like really like stuffed with fluff they're like the only thing that can keep my feet warm. So Amazing. that's my thing. That's what I need. Nice. You wear them to bed? You sleep yeah. In them? I like, I mean, yeah, like usually wow. I like wake up with them kicked off because yeah. they get too warm at night, but I find it really hard to fall asleep if I can feel them. Oh, so cold. Like, so cold, yeah. Cold yeah. feet. Yeah. That's fair. See, I, I'm like, the, I just can't do like, and like socks on in bed. I don't know why. I think it's like the friction thing. Yeah. Yeah. Makes me feel weird, but I, I get that. But I like I quite like being cold. Like I'd yeah. rather be I'd rather be I'd rather be too cold than too hot. But I think that probably is like because of where I'm from. Yeah. I think it's something that I'm like because for me it's also like when people say like which would you rather be? I think, well, if you're too cold, there's always so much you can do to rectify that. Yeah. You can add like a ton of layers. Uh -huh. But if you're too hot, there's only so much you can take off. Exactly. Yeah. And then you run out <laughs> you run out of possibilities. So yeah. I think it's more possible to rectify. But thank you so much for coming on. It was so, so lovely. This was such a great chat. Yeah, this has been Anna, good. do you want to like shout yourself out? What's your Instagram handle? <laughs> it's just my name with a dot and an underscore. Nice. Well, I'll link it in the show notes if anyone wants to, to follow along on Maisie's journey of like moving from Perth to Perth and then now moving back again mm -hmm. and having that whole experience. But uh, thank you so much for listening, everyone. And uh, tune in next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Before you go, please do leave a review and follow slash subscribe wherever you're listening to us. And don't forget to check us out on our social media as you can find us on Instagram and TikTok at Fancy Blather and our website will be up very soon with all our rebranding. So stay tuned for that. And that is just fancyblather.com. Don't forget to check out our sister podcast, new episode on Monday. Just search Small Talk in Spotify to follow along with them too. Have a good week. Bye.